Good afternoon, gentlemen. And thanks, Bridget, for giving me that slot before tea. Uh, well, I, I can see one, two, three, four, five people in this room who have already heard me present this. But don't worry, there is something interesting for those five who have heard me. There are 10 new slides in this presentation. The first person who's going to tell me which are the 10 slides after I finish my presentation gets a complimentary copy of my book. So keep a lookout for that. Well, the topic today is pre-salvage casualty surveys, planning, and execution. First thing, all the photographs that you see here are taken on site except for one or two, which I have specifically mentioned there, and they're just for the purposes of illustration. To move on, with all due respects to all the salvers and the salvage consultants, what is marine salvage? It's a science of vague assumptions based on debatable figures taken from inconclusive experiments and performed with instruments of problematic accuracy. And the persons performing them are of doubtful real, uh, reliability and questionable mentality. Well, I'm not saying this. The author says this in the book, Mud, Muscle, and Miracles. But then having said so, why are so many of the salvage operations successful? Well, it's only and only meticulous planning. And so does it go when we go for a pre-salvage casualty inspection. If we do not plan, if we do not have a methodology of how we are going to execute the survey, we are probably not going to be able to do that survey. The saying that if you fail to plan, you plan to fail, perfectly applies in this profession of salvage and salvage-related surveys. You will appreciate that casualties don't, or rather most of the times, don't occur at places which are easily accessible. I mean, if it was, if it was at a very accessible place, it would have been easy to salvage. And that's the very reason why we need quite a lot of planning here, because they don't happen at places which are easily accessible or easily salved. Simple case, it's along a beach, very easy approach, no problems. As you can see, this is a deserted island in the Andaman group of islands, a marine national park. Problem. You see this one, a pristine reef in the Maldives with a spawning ground for hammerhead sharks. A bigger problem as far as the PNI clubs are concerned. As I said, these could occur at several places, normally places which are inaccessible, making it a logistic concern for the salvers as well as the surveyor who is going there for an inspection. Or they could be in an environmentally sensitive area where the issues about claims as far as the clubs are concerned, pollution, loss of uh, or rather damage to environment and marine life is concerned. Again, such areas could be problematic to get access to. They could happen at politically unstable or unsafe areas. And to make it worse, it could be a combination of all three. Like any salvage which I said earlier, even this survey needs meticulous planning. A lot and lot has to go before the surveyor actually even reaches the site. So what is it that goes into it? Let's see that. The tabletop survey. I, I can see a couple of eyebrows being raised there. Tabletop survey, what is this guy talking about? But yes, gentlemen, it's this tabletop survey that's going to lead you to a successful execution of your assignment. Don't have your eyebrows raised. We'll see what this tabletop survey is. Find out about the location. As I said, location plays a quite a lot of bearing onto your arrangements that you do. If, if you find out exactly where your ship is and you're able to identify how your routes are going to be, which you'll see in some slides how, how challenging it can get, you have conquered one major aspect. Now with location, you'll, you'll, you would have got information. These days there are quite a lot of uh, 
tools that you can use, Google Earth, Google Map, and, and you have it. But be reminded that all these tools that you may use are not current. So how much to rely on them will only come by experience. Let us see some particular examples that we actually did. This, the vessel, I have, I have blocked off some names for uh, some reasons. The vessel was aground here. This, these are, uh, yeah, the, there are, these are uh, two neighboring countries which are hostile. This is absolutely a marshy area, a salt pan area. The last navigable point for boats is here. About eight kilometers from this point was the international boundary with three kilometers of no man's land. When we were appointed to go here, we had a strict and clear instruction from the local coast guard that you are not taking any boat to go from here to here. Because there were quite a lot of incidences where there was accid accidental crossing of boundaries and people were imprisoned. So the only route that we were left was to go through the swamp. We could only take a small rib or a flat bottom boat till this point and walk this distance. And this distance was 12 kilometers. Now you tell me, would this passage to this casualty been possible if there was no planning? You had to plan as to when you reach this so that it's low tide, so that you are able to walk in those four hours, five hours to that vessel, be on the vessel, try and disembark at the next low tide so that you are able to take your rib out and get back to this place. You absolutely needed a lot of planning. Similarly, let's look at this. This was a recent one that we did. This was in Lourdes, Namibia. Again, I'm not naming vessels. Fantastic place where the ship was aground against a beach of a diamond mine. But you couldn't pass the diamond mine. Neither could you go by boats. So the only way that we had to do is take local permissions, take a long detour, go over, and go on the ship. But if you don't have these informations, if you don't do this sort of planning before you proceed to your casualty site, boarding the vessel is just next to impossible. A typical picture, that is, that is, where, the ship, that is where the ship was. And that was the kind of terrain that you had to pass through. Nothing but four by four vehicles could take you there. You had to do all this sitting in your offices, trying to see what kind of terrain is there, what kind of infrastructure is available. It's literally a remote controlled operation as far as logistics is concerned. But we got to do that. Next comes permissions. As I said, if we have to go through all such terrains and all such difficult uh, things, getting permissions is very, very important. When it comes to permissions, now as I said, if we were to do a job in Lourdes, Namibia, sitting in Bombay, sitting in India, it was absolutely difficult for anyone in our office to actually get those permissions. How did we get those permissions? The biggest and the most important aspect here is having a network, and having a network worldwide. And that's where we are all here for. If we can help each other onto such jobs, and if we can give assistance of a network to get necessary permissions, that is the most appreciated. Should any one of you need anything back in India, more than welcome. Once you have the permissions, there is no one who's going to stop you from going on board. But you should ensure that you have the permissions. Do not go without permissions. By the time you're doing all this, you'll be having quite a lot of information flow from, from the vessel to you, from the club to you, or whoever has appointed it. You could be appointed by the club, you could be appointed by the hull and machinery underwriters, you could be appointed by the salvers, you could be appointed by ship owners. I mean, whoever appoints you is going to give you quite a lot of information till the time you're doing all this groundwork. Get and collate all this information. Be hungry for information during your tabletop survey. That's more, most important, because the more information you get, the more equipped you are to actually carry out your survey. As you're getting your information, you know what is the risk that you are exposed to, do a very thorough risk assessment. A very important aspect. One small slip off, you will see that in some of the later slides, and you could land up in problem. Doing a proper risk assessment here, whilst you are in the office, before you leave, is 
very, very vital. You can't miss this out. Just can't miss this out. Having done the risk assessment, you will come to know what difficulties you're going to face on board. If, if the casualty is manned, well, your hardships are less. But if it's a wreck, if it's an unmanned casualty, that much the more difficult. You might have no one to pass a line to take a line from your boat. There would be no one to put down an accommodation ladder or a pilot ladder to you for, for boarding the ship. How are you going to do with this? That's, that's the only thing risk assessment can bring to light, and that is what equipments you will need. You will say, we are not salvers. What, 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 why are we talking about equipments? You will see that in the next few slides, why you need equipments. Simple equipments. Most of us have this. Ropes, knives, carabiners, safety harnesses, wet bags. Simple things, simple stuff. Carry it along with you. Some complicated stuff. Furthermore, uh, stronger carabiners, GPSs, underwater cameras, small level gauges with angle indicators, gas meters, some simple tags, very useful things. These, are, th these tags have been made by my nephew, and I, I use them in my salvage, and he's so very happy. Well, I use them for uh, sounding, especially when the, the, the water-finding pace just doesn't work. Use these tags, really helpful. Simple things, it's, it's only about being innovative. The booties, especially when you're doing your uh, reef uh, damage surveys, etc. A simple thing like a plumb line, very useful. Still, you feel you don't need to invest in equipments? What if you are in a situation like this? Do you think you really don't need equipments? We do. Certainly, we do. Once ready, do not delay in proceeding to the casualty site. That's, that's very simple. But then, don't expect that you would be going on board like any other normal surveyor with a proper ISM style boarding arrangements for you with a net under the gangway. No. Gentlemen, this is not the kind of arrangements that we will find when we are going on casualties. It's absolutely high risk. And once we, when we are saying high risk, we also get to take care of our insurances. Very, very important. If we don't have the right kind of insurances for the casualties that we are boarding, not safe. Don't expect to be that to be an easy ride. It could be as messy as this. Same, as messy as this. This is this, these are the pictures of the same casualty which I just told you were on the border of two hostile countries. This is the one that I just showed you in Namibia. Uh, look at this. If you don't have local knowledge, if you can see this ledge, I mean, if I don't live in the desert, Probably Uday lives in the desert. He must have seen something like this. I haven't. But I would have easy, if I was driving it myself, I would have easily mistaken this to be a flat land. And I would have found myself somewhere else. So having local knowledge and local team is very important. Or good car. <laughs> of course, yes. Of course, yes. <laughs> As I said, risk assessment. Again, now this, this looks to be a very simple thing. This is, this is a picture which I have taken standing on, the, standing on the casualties bridge wing, you can actually see the shore. The shore was just about 65 to 70 meters away from the ship. Simple approach, isn't it? Going on board. What's the big deal? We all walk 70 meters into the beach sometimes to swim. Yes, very simple. Look at this gentleman walking straight. Look at this gentleman walking straight. Look at this gentleman yet straight. Look at this fellow. He's literally thrown off. This happens when the casualty at, is at an angle on the beach, and you have breakers coming from one side. There is a severe rip current on the other side of the ship from where the breakers are coming, and this could happen. If you don't take care of this, we could have accidents. Very, very important, rip currents could be dangerous. Be prepared for the unexpected. A risk assessment gone wrong. We enjoyed it, but yes, it's a mistake which I should share. It's a risk assessment gone wrong. We, I mean, who carries a spare OVM? But yes, our boat hit a rock. We broke the propeller blades and a day enjoying ourselves with fish caught on the beach. And that was Maldives, so I was happy. Well, another surprise. This was a wreck. 
there was a, a pilot ladder hanging there. We gave a few tugs before we tried to board the casualty. Everything seemed fine. We still gave a couple of tugs. Everything seemed fine. And when I was just about four runs from the top, it, it broke. But then you got to be careful. You got to be cautious and you got to be prepared. That's what I say. Be prepared for the unexpected. Or you may have a casualty like this. Very simple. She's excellently on the beach. You can actually go. The captain can put a pilot ladder here and you can climb. But gentlemen, you could go no beyond these draft marks because of the rip currents. The vessel had no power. They couldn't put down a crane or a sling to hoist the surveyor. The only way was, how many of us want to do it? It's not about want to do it. If you are appointed, we have to do it. But then there are certain skills which are worth learning and worth developing if you want to get into such kind of service. If you know abseiling, if you know mountaineering, if you know basic mountaineering knots, this is not difficult. And that is where the carabiners were for. I literally use the carabiners to climb up this rope. But again, risk, you should be able to assess that beforehand. All this information comes to you when you're planning. Another type, probably you could be boarding the vessel through a gaping hole like this. Again, don't go by the surveyor's attire. I mean, half of the time, the surveyor is myself. Don't go at the attire, because you actually had to swim to that ship. So it was not possible that I go in my safety shoes and my boiler suits to board that ship. Your diving suit is the only option. Again, gentlemen, this is one particular aspect where your interpersonal skills are at test. And we should ensure that they are the best. You will appreciate that whenever there is a casualty, the ship's crew is under tremendous stress. They have had the worst, probably. And they are seeing this gentleman coming from the shore, probably with his bags or whatever it is, depending on how, how you are boarding. And there they are relaxed. We have someone here to take care of us. They don't know who is he, whether he's a surveyor or he's a salver, they don't know. But the first person that they see coming along, they want to throw their overalls back, relax. That's natural. That's human tendency. And it is at such times that you actually need the best support from the ship's crew. And if your interpersonal skills are really good, you can actually put them at ease and get the maximum information out of them. Because if it's not for the ship's crew who's going to tell you what happened, who's going to tell you? That's the reason why interpersonal skills are a big must. The master, very, very tensed. If you can read the body language, look at the way he's holding a cigarette. Very tense. The moment I went on board, the first five minutes were spent hugging. I mean, don't take me wrong, but, <laughs> but that was how it was. That was how tense he was. So thank God I have someone to talk to other than my 10 crew members. He was so desperate to get out of that situation. But then you got to comfort them. That's how it is. And most, most often, as a surveyor, you would be there before the salvers. And if that's how it has happened, then you've got to comfort him. If you have a crew like this, nothing like it. Your half the problems are solved because they already are in good spirits. Some of you must have recognized who this gentleman are, at least one of them. But then if this is, this is the spirit, your battle is won. On-site survey, now is the crucial thing. What, what do we have to do once we are on-site? Preliminary survey, I mean, nothing, nothing more to emphasize. It's, it's just simple preliminary things. What happened? When did it happen? Where did it happen? Did it happen here or did it happen somewhere and the ship came to wherever she is? How did it happen? The weather and tide then and now, that gives you a difference between the tidal conditions there, tidal conditions now. Other factors affecting the casualties. What, what are the fatalities, if any? Crew morale, cargo, forecasted weather, etc. These, these should be just brief. Probably things like weather, etc., etc., you, you would have even have had before you actually go. But it's only a matter of collating this as a preliminary report and sending it to your instructing principal so he gets a visual picture of what is happening on board. Not very difficult. Once you have filtered this information down, 
Then comes the detailed survey, and this is what takes the maximum number of time. I would say at yeah, the detailed survey, you have the topside and hull and machinery survey. It's a diving and external survey, hydrographic, cargo, pollution aspect, and aerial survey. We'll come to each one of them uh, individually. These, these are all pictures, so I'm sure you're going to enjoy that. We'll concentrate on the top side and the hull and machinery. I have combined this deliberately. Top side, as it says, it's just basically inspection of all the fittings and the appendages on the deck. Reason being, once the salvers come, if they know that there is an issue with the fittings, it may happen at times, it may not happen at most times, so it depends if the fittings are good. You, you actually got to see how those connections and the fittings are if they can be used for pulling or towing or whatever salvage related activities. When you're looking at the top, just don't concentrate on the top, also look at the undersides because what may be good on top may not be good beneath. So pay particular attention, be very careful. This was the case of the casualty two and a half days after she was aground. The ship was aground on 15th August 2011. This is the picture taken on the 17th afternoon. Can you believe it? Walking on things like this can be disastrous, but please be careful. You need to take care of this. This also gives you quite a lot of other indications. I mean, if there are any marine biologists here, that can give you an indication as to how rich the sea is around with respect to corals and other marine life. Once you have done the top side, do a thorough hull and machinery survey. Hull and machinery, it's not the risk assessment perspective, but actually what is wrong with the hull, what is wrong with the machinery. Going into the DB tanks can reveal a lot of things like this as to what the ship is actually suffering from. If you can pass on this information to your principals, to the salvers, Whoever has appointed you, quite a lot of information goes to them, and they are well prepared. They see, they can rather foresee what they should be doing. It helps them plan their moves. So how good you do your survey, the results of the salvage could be dependent on that. Try and see if there are any deflections in the vessel, whether she is hogging and sagging. It's, it's not just about going on a ship, and as, as the ladies from Matrix said, walking through the survey, we can't walk through a salvage survey. When, when, when you're doing a pre-salvage casualty inspection, it is nothing less than four or five tides that you got to be on the ship, see how she behaves if you have that much time. If not, could be at least a minimum of two tides, you got to see how she behaves. Those are the timings when you could actually know whether the ship is flexing or not, whether she's hogging, whether she's sagging. Simple things, stretch a line across two fixed points, keep measuring them, you get a good indication of whether she is hogging or sagging or whatever. Something that can happen to a ship. This has happened nothing but because of the breakers. The rolling breakers that were hitting the side of the ship, the whole ship side has collapsed. Very difficult. Take good care of such things when they are happening. Engine rooms could be flooded, noting uh, the levels of liquid at various uh, periods and times of uh, tides is a very good clue whether the engine room is flooded directly or is she flooded indirectly through some of the storage tanks or ballast tanks. But this has to be a regular exercise. Sounding of all tanks and engine room. A diving and external survey is very, very important. If you can actually walk around the casualty and see how the conditions are externally, that can give you quite a lot of clues. You could see whether if, if, if the propellers or the rudders are uh, visible during low tide, you can have a check onto that, whether there is, how, how is the condition, whether the shaft tubes are leaking, whether there is any flow of liquid inwards and outwards. Very important. It may be possible, it may not be possible. It depends on what the circumstances. If not, a diving survey is very, very important. If you're a diver yourself, good. Nothing bad, but I should, I should say here that if you're a diver and if you're not a commercial diver, Please, please, please do not go under any floating object. That is not permitted unless you are a commercial diver. But if, if you are not, or rather if you are, are a commercial diver, do not miss that opportunity to dive and see what is around the ship. Juvenile corals. Again, corals around the ship. If you are able to give this kind of information, 
to your clients with the help of a marine biologist if you are able to identify the sp species that are there nothing like it it gives them a clear picture of what they are dealing with or rather what they will have to deal with in case if there is any pollution there again as i said i'll go back to the slide as you are not a diver a simple underwater camera today these cameras are available for as cheap as $300 $400 the olympus mu tough series i mean i'm not marketing olympus mu tough but i'm just giving an example dunk them down into the water from the pilot ladder that you have come up take a few pictures you'll get a clear idea of what is there or what is not there though it will not be as good as the diving survey but that still helps so if these these are small investments in equipment that you will need good cameras as uh, we just heard the previous speaker say that we need higher resolution uh, pictures same is the case here we need good high quality pictures here yeah. yep perfect thanks then is the hydrographic survey by saying hydrographic survey it's not the conventional hydrographic survey where we start preparing charts no that's this is not that hydro hydrographic survey it is just about trying to know what are the applicable charts here what are the what are the approaches to this place what charts would be in use what are the tides at this particular place how far is the tidal station that is monitoring the tides so is there a variance between the times published for the high tides and low tides and those actually happening is there any variance between the tidal heights just make a note of this and you don't need any sophisticated equipments for this i mean a dan dan by pole uh, shoved onto the beach probably can do the trick if you have marked it at regular intervals and you keep monitoring it for consecutive tides and then measure it against or rather cross reference it against the published tide table you will automatically know what it is take a rib or take a boat around and take depths around the uh, casualties you will you will automatically come to know whether the charted depths there are actually matching with the physical depths that helps again the salvers to decide what assets to bring to the casualty sites so this is what i mean by the hydro hydrographic survey here do that as best as possible that also gives you aspects of how the ship is resting onto the sea uh, seabed there charts then cargo very important because all depends if the cargo is hazardous or the cargo is sensitive you may have to actually get the cargo off before you try anything else a typical case oily water mix not a serious concern no problems but still an issue if this would have leaked out beautiful any guesses for what the cargo is you're right sir it's cement bags what can happen or rather what has happened permanent ballast whatever they could salvage pardon the opposite, the opposite. <laughs> okay so this this is what it is this was a gas carrier with propane butane mix 10000 tons of propane butane mix you had to actually do the light rage before you could even attempt doing anything with regards to her pulling out but then this has to be noted now again in this you may not be expert at all cargoes you may not be a gas tanker expert you may not be an agri expert but then it matters to synergize amongst ourselves and take the expertise from our pool and see that you are able to do this and i have been lucky enough i should say that i had fellow uh, surveyors from the ims who did help me on almost each and every one of this uh, casualties that i showed you next would be the pollution aspects this is another important thing from the pni perspective how much of pollution has been caused or was there an existing pollution at that particular site if so what was the nature is it documented if the pollution is recent what are the clean up activities being done is someone monitoring that is someone logging them up very important take this picture of a we we all can see tar tar balls here these are actually from the fresh pollution incident but when we took a scoop of sand out the results were something different this beach had existing pollution if we can see these layers of dark lines in between these were past pollution incidences noting this is very important or else the pna underwriter 
would be straddled with huge claims for unwarranted cleanup activities. So if this can be documented as early as possible, it is very, very important. Yep, finished. Log in any clean, cleanup activities if they are happening. Again, collect samples. Good if you have to do fuel oil fingerprinting. If when you're collecting samples, also ensure you have the proper positions logged. And not when I say positions, it's not the location, but the GPS coordinates. So should tomorrow there be a litigation, things can be proved. Aerial uh, surveys, very important. Aerial surveys don't cost much. Many a times I had to request my uh, principals that we should do an aerial survey because it gives a much more clearer picture of what conditions the casualty is. And I got queries saying, is the surveyor interested in flying? It's not about whether the surveyor is interested in flying. Probably the surveyor, all of us have flown enough times and we are not crazy for flying. But the information that comes out of an aerial survey is immense. Does anyone have to tell here how much of reef damage has happened here? One picture, does it say it all? Simple. I, I need not describe this in words. One picture and my underwriter knows what the damage is. Same thing. What is the condition? What are the breakers? What is the depth? I mean, okay, I can't actually sound and give him, but it's a good visual indication of what it is. This is the sh same ship which you saw with the sides, ship side fallen off. Site safety, very important. Site safety, here, this is, this is not about site safety once. This site safety in casualty uh, surveys is very, very dynamic. Conditions are changing with every tide. What conditions were present on board during this low tide may not be the same during the next low tide because probably the ship has listed further. Things are not the same. They are very, very dynamic. So you've got to do your risk assessment on board on a regular basis. It has to be continual activity. And if you do a proper risk assessment continuously and take adequate measures, you and your team would be back home safe. Just some pictures to show you. This is the worst enemy of any surveyor, especially if the wreck is unmanned. Breakers slamming onto the ship side can be disastrous. I'm telling you this from my own experience. These can be very, very disastrous. Please be careful of these. Don't undermine them. If everything done well, you head back home safe. Again, as I said, learn and use right imaging techniques because a picture speaks a thousand words. We need any text to describe how far the ship has come on the shore? We don't. Do we have to tell them whoever the under, uh, instructing principal is what is the terrain around? You don't. Do you need to tell anyone what are the hydrodynamic forces acting along the bottom of the ship? You don't. What happened during the salvage? Self-explanatory, the ship's lifted by the stern and refloated. Importance of imaging, if you take the correct high definition imaging and you just simply change your ga gamma levels, I mean, this is going a little technical, but it makes sense to say, tell you, if you just change the gamma levels, you can actually see what is under the water. Simple, a simple play with Adobe Photoshop. Okay, this, does, this is not valid for an evidence when it goes in arbitration, but for the purposes of illustration, for the purpose of references, changing your gamma levels in the Photoshop will give you something that is hidden beneath the top level. So knowing the imaging techniques is very, very important. Yep, I'm finished, I'm done. And if the master who stands before you boarded, smiles with confidence, it's a job well done. Thank you. So I think we have coffee and we can take questions.
simple innovations in equipment can be and uh, assessing the safety and the dynamic changing of, the, uh, of things over time. Um, we, I know John Noble and I, we collaborated on a book for the Nautical Institute on predatory management guidelines where we tried to set out a, a, um, a chronological progress of a, of a casualty. Mm -hmm. But we all knew that it was not that simple. <laughs> Yeah, this, in, in this particular survey, it's all about assessing your risk. Yeah. Because it's, it's not a conventional survey, it's not a normal survey where you go with your safety shoes, boiler suit, and, and it's and it is great. very dynamic. Like to, uh, look at your book Thank you. Like well, amongst the five, who, okay, yes, sir? What I actually miss was the communication with the authorities. Yes. Yes, I, I do appreciate that, and that is the uh, that is the particular point when I mention about permissions. Yeah. When when we are out there to take permissions, obviously it would be from the authorities. Secondly, as the, the important point which you mentioned that if it is taking too long, then obviously the authorities would take over. But then as a surveyor, primarily, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. There are quite a few senior surveyors and senior people here. I mean, as a surveyor, I wouldn't give any information to the authorities unless so specifically instructed. As a surveyor, yes, it would take certain amount of time, a day, two days, three days, for the job to complete, depending on the complexity of the job. But then, that is the time that it will take. So even if the authority surveyors come there, I don't think they'll be able to do a job any lesser than what you would be doing. So that's, that's a reasonable delay and a logical delay, so. Yeah. You wanted to ask something? Fine, excellent. Thank you. Thank you.